Hello, everyone. Uh, I would first like you to meet my friend who has come up on stage with me, and his name is Leo. And as you can see, he does not exist. Right? <laughs> this is how probably people felt when somebody proposed the idea of having a number that would represent nothing. And this idea was toyed by civilizations like the Greeks, the Mayans, and the Babylonians, but they, they couldn't accept it completely, so they rejected it. Until some great minds in the Indian subcontinent came up with this idea of having a symbol that would represent nothing, and along with nine other symbols, they came out with a very new number system that would change the face of mathematics in the years to come. In this talk, I'll be sharing with you some incredible ideas that developed in India in the past thousands of years, which was going to be you know, from very unassuming areas like poetry, music, dance, rituals, and so on. So to get started, let's go back uh, about 3,000 years, where uh, we, we come across Baudhayana. He was a person who lived during the time when people were worshipping the nature by making fire altars. And when they made these fire altars, they had to use geometrical shapes like squares, right triangles, and so on. And when they explored the shape of squares, they observed that the ratio of the diagonal of the square to its side was some constant, but they weren't able to get the exact value of that particular constant. And today we know that that constant is square root of 2, and I'm sure you all would remember your high school days when your teacher told you that it's an irrational number, which sounded very irrational to us because, you know, it goes unending forever and ever and ever. And Baudhana gives a very interesting formula to calculate the value of 2 about 3,000 years ago. He says, add one-third to 1, and a quarter of one-third multiplied by one thirty-fourth subtracted from 1, and you will get an interesting fraction 577 over 408, and that will be equal to, or approximately equal to the value of square root of 2. And I would urge you to take out your calculator and do this operation, and you will see that the value is accurate up to five decimal places. I know what's running in your mind. How on earth did he get that particular formula? Right? But that's not all. In fact, he uses a word, saviseshaha, that appears at the end of the verse, where he makes a big claim. He says that this value that I'm giving you is not accurate, but only close to or approximate. Now, how does he know that this value is not accurate and approximate? So there is a lot of discussion that happens on this particular word by historians, where they believe that the value of root 2 or the irrationality of root 2 was known in some sense to Baudhayana, and that is why he specifically uses the word saviseshaha, which means close to. Remember, what is the motivation for discussion and irrationality of root 2? It was construction of fire altars and geometry. We move on for about a few centuries, and we are in some place in probably uh, modern-day Pakistan where we meet Pingala. And Pingala was the author of Chandas Shastra. And Chandas is a branch of study that deals with the rules for writing poetry. And as many of us know that in those days, uh, Indian texts were written in poetical form, which means it had to follow a particular structure so that it could be sung in melodious tunes. And while making these structures, a poet had to keep in mind the syllables in Sanskrit, which were of two types. One is Laghu and the other is Guru. Now, what does this mean? So if I say the word Shri Rama, so Shri and Ra take more time to pronounce and Ma takes lesser time. So Shri and Ra are Gurus and Ma is a Laghu. The question that Pingala was trying to explore is, if I want to construct a four-syllable meter, how many combinations can I have using Laghus and Gurus? I can have a verse with all four Gurus, or maybe I can have with some combination of Laghus and Gurus. And then he continued his thought. He said, can I have an algorithm in which I can list all these things down? And if I have an algorithm, is there a particular way in which I can find the row number of a particular pattern without doing the entire listing? And if I'm given a particular row number, can I find the actual appearance of the actual pattern of the string without doing this listing? And today, students of computer science would say that, hey, these are nothing but our listing and sorting algorithms, which, was, which, was, which he was discussing. And we find the motivation for these discussions for Pingala was not computer science, but poetry. So Pingala continues his exploration, and if you see, uh, if you replace all these Gs with 0 and L with 1, you'll see that it gives you the binary listing from 0 till 15. 
Now the question is, did Pingala know zero, or did he talk about zero? In fact, Pingala's text is the oldest text that we see the appearance of zero as a symbol that we are using today, and he uses the word shunyam, which means zero in Sanskrit, and he is using this particular verse to give an algorithm to find the powers of two. Now we might think, what's the big deal about powers of two? If, let's say, we want to calculate two to the power 100, one way is we can multiply two 99 times, but that's not a very efficient way of doing that particular calculation. So what Pingala did was he came up with an algorithm with which we can do two to the power 100 in much lesser number of steps. In fact, this algorithm is still used in computer science as a very optimum algorithm for finding powers of two. He continued his exploration, and then he came up with this particular triangle. And as I can see, most of you are from science background, so you might have seen this triangle back in 11th standard or 12th standard. And we use this for finding the binomial coefficients. And he called this triangle as Varnameru. And of course, we know that Blaise Pascal discovered this particular triangle about 2,000 years later. When we hear about all these things about Pingala, we might think that, oh, such a great genius. All these things came out of one head. But that is not true, because we also see works before Pingala that talk about permutations, combinations, binary mathematics, and all that. And interestingly, those texts were not mathematical texts. They were texts on medicine. And in fact, we also see a lot of uh, people who followed Pingala. And we cannot call a single one of them as mathematicians, because they were writing texts on different fields, and they were using all these areas of mathematics in some sense or the other. For example, we see musicians, we see astronomers in this list. In fact, we see Hemachandra, who lived in the 12th century, who was a contemporary to uh, Fibonacci, who gave the famous Fibonacci sequence. And Fibonacci discovers the sequence while he observes the breeding pattern in rabbits, and Hemachandra discovers the same sequence when he is observing the math behind, um, uh, what do you call that, P percussion instruments. So it is interesting to see that at two different civilizations during the same time, two different people talk about the same mathematical concept, and the motivation is completely different. We move ahead now 2,000 years, and we go to France, where we meet uh, Fermat. Fermat was a great mathematician and a lawyer, and he was, uh, uh, he was considered as the father of modern-day number theory. And Fermat poses a problem to his contemporary. In fact, Fermat is famous for throwing open a lot of problems that a lot of mathematicians worked on in the years ahead. So Fermat asks, is it possible to find the smallest uh, integer solution for this equation, x square minus 61y square equals 1? Now, for those of you who took a vow that you will not touch mathematics beyond 12th standard, let me just try to explain what that means. That is, can you find two whole numbers x and y, such that if you square y and multiply it with 61 and subtract it from x square, the result should be 1. So what is the smallest such uh, pair of uh, two whole numbers? And we'll see an interesting connect to this particular question that was posed by Fermat. But let's go back 1,000 years to uh, India, where we meet Brahmagupta who gave some rules for multiplication with negative integers and 0. And what is interesting is that by the, by the time of Brahmagupta in 7th century, the decimal place value system was already in place. And people were comfortable using 0 and a bit of negative integers. So Brahmagupta is the first person who gives rules for operations with negative integers. And interestingly, we see that negative integers came to Europe much later. In fact, they were accepted as something sensible only in the 18th or 19th century in Europe. Brahmagupta continues his exploration in one of my favorite topics, uh, which is geometry. And he says, if you take two triplets, you can do a lot of things with that. And I'm sure you all recollect uh, your high school days when we learned Pythagorean triplets. That is, if we have three whole numbers, a, b, and c, a square plus b square should be equal to c square, right? So if you take any two triplets like that, let's say 5, 12, uh, 5, 3, 4, 5, and 5, 12, 13, and you multiply them in an interesting way, you will see some really amazing numbers that emerge. You might think, what's so amazing about those four numbers? Uh, what is interesting is that if you add 39 square and 52 square, you will get the answer the same as 25 square plus 60 square. Now, for those of you who are not interested in mathematics, you might be, what, what's the big deal about it? But this thing is, today we call it tetrads, and it is used in this area of geometry called cyclic quadrilaterals. And that is what Brahmagupta was trying to explore when he started with triplets. 
And then he continues his exploration. In fact, he is unstoppable. He just goes ahead using tetrads. He goes into number theory and an area uh, under number theory called the Pell's equation. So what is the Pell's equation? Uh, this example, that is x square minus 2y square equals 1, is one form of Pell's equation. Instead of that 2, you can put anything over there, and it will still be a part of Pell's equation. And he is looking for integer solutions for these equations. Now, what does that mean? Again, if you substitute in this case, 3 in the place of x and 2 in the place of y, we can see that 3 square minus 2 times 4 gives you 1. So 3 comma 2 is a valid solution for this particular equation. And Brahmagupta said you can have more such solutions and you know you, you will get infinitely many solutions. But then one might think, was Brahmagupta really jobless? Why was he doing all these things? Does it didn't have any other things to do? Because he was an astronomer actually. So he is talking about Pell's equation. Uh, because he wants to do something with, you know, these numbers, x and y. And if you remember the last solution, 577.408, just a while ago we had discussed that Baudhana gives the same two numbers as a fraction using, uh, you know, to find the approximate square root of 2. And that is precisely why Brahmagupta is also using this particular equation. So he gets into the value of, uh, you know, square root of 2 using algebra and geometry. So the motivation is to find square root of numbers and then Brahmagupta says instead of 2, if you put any integer d, which is not a square number, if you are able to solve uh, this equation and get values for x and y, you can get better approximation of square root of d. Remember this is happening in 7th century back in India, but Brahmagupta is not able to solve this for any value of d. So he poses the question and then probably leaves it to his successors to work on it. And the equation that we had seen, the question that was posed by Fermat 1000 years later, is the same equation where the value of d is 61. And there is an interesting connect to this, which we will come back just in a while. What Fermat didn't know that the problem that he is posing as a very challenging problem was already solved by some mathematicians back in India five or six centuries earlier. And we see that the problem that he poses as a very challenging problem, the smallest integer solution for this one, we see in the work of Bhaskar Acharya II in the 12th century. And as you can see, the numbers are pretty small. Uh, it is something like uh, 1.7 billion odd and 226 million odd numbers. And this was worked down with hand and head, mind you, back in 12th century or 11th century. So what do we see here? We see that a question that was posed by Brahmagupta in the 7th century was continued by mathematicians in the coming centuries and over a period of 500 years, they had developed a perfect algorithm to solve this particular problem, which later was discovered in Europe as the Pell's equation. This is a funny remark that a French mathematician made. He said that what might have been Fermat's you know, surprise if somebody would have told him that, hey, the problem that you're posing as a very challenging problem is something that has been already solved five, six centuries back by some native Indians. Just to put everything into context, whatever uh, we have seen so far, the first thing is we see a beautiful line of research that happened in India. Because we see works that have been cited, uh, I mean, works which were written centuries or even millenniums later. And that has been continued by people who came later on. And this is precisely how research is done even today. So it is not one independent person's work. It is a lineage that is continued ahead. What made Indians come up with these abstract ideas like zero, infinity, and all that? Was it some philosophical ideas that was present in India? Because we see philosophies that supported nothingness exist. And on the other hand, we had philosophies that believed in a supreme infinite being. So this kind of diversity, did it help Indians come up with these abstract ideas? Because Greeks were also very good in geometry, uh, in mathematics uh, as such, but they couldn't come up with these kind of things. They rejected the idea. In fact, we see similar diversity in Europe, especially during the Renaissance period. And we see a lot of new ideas that were coming up because of, uh, you know, the diversity probably. So is diversity in India that has always existed a very uh, good thing that supports come up, coming up with all these uh, good ideas. Imagine a computer science teacher coming to the class and teaching permutations and combinations through music, poetry, and dance. I'm sure all of us would want to sit in that particular lecture. 
right? So I think there are a lot of ideas that we can borrow from history of especially Indian mathematics, where we see that every idea in mathematics is backed by some kind of real life application, and the motivation came from real life instances. So those things, I think, we can still use in uh, modern day classrooms. The last point, but not the least, is the kind of uh, people that we have seen so far, all these names we have uh, seen on the screen, we cannot call them as only mathematicians because they were good in many areas. So they were polymaths. They, we cannot say that this person only worked in mathematics. So what made these kind of people experts in various disciplines? Was it the decompartmentalized learning that they had in those times when uh, subjects were not put into different buckets as against how it is today? Because we, we learn algebra in a different bucket, geometry is in a different bucket, and people who learn biology don't even look at maths, and vice versa, right? So is this decompartmentalization of subjects really hampering our intelligence and brilliance to come out? And this is something that I think we need to think. And keeping all these things in mind, I think it will be a good idea to take a route back to the roots and start thinking how we can use these ideas in modern day classrooms. And I think that's an idea worth sharing. Thank you.